too. That's true. Okay, perfect. So welcome. I see we have people coming into this webinar today. Uh, we have a very, very exciting uh, topic today. At least I'm excited, but I am easily excited as well. Uh, we're going to speak to Amanda and Shoshana here about their uh, surrogate, uh, surrogate stories, about their experiences. Uh, we're just going to give people a couple of minutes uh, to kind of uh, jump in here. We are last minute ourselves in this webinar, so we definitely want to give people some time to figure out Zooms and work and lunch and everything. Uh, so for the ones that are here, uh, you can ask questions anonymously throughout the uh, webinar today. Uh, so there should be a Q&A button somewhere on your screen, depending on if you're on an iPad, iPhone or anything else. Uh, so feel free to do that. We will have some uh, time for questions at the end. Uh, but we also want to make sure that um, you ask them continuously as we go through the presentation and listen to these lovely ladies talk about their experience of surrogacy and all of those exciting parts. Uh, so yeah, let's get started and people can kind of join in as we go. Uh, so let me just open up my presentation here and we will get rolling today. This is always fun to see if this works. Okay, nods of approval if this is visible <laughs> of uh, Shoshana and Amanda. Okay, look happy. It's good to meet. Great. Awesome. Yes, we love these pictures. I don't know why we have a double picture here, but we'll, hopefully that's not a thing that will happen uh, throughout the presentation. Uh, so we want to start off a little bit by telling you about uh, today's schedule. So we're going to have a little bit of an introduction here, which I will do. And then we'll talk a little bit about Hatch and PFCLA because we want you to know who we are and who's speaking to you. Uh, I've seen the registrant. A lot of you guys are actually in touch with us already or uh, are registered to different things. So it's nice to see you again. Uh, but we also want to give the ones that are new to this a little bit of insight of Hatch and PFCLA. And then we're going to talk about who is the typical surrogate. I never find the right word for this. I can only do the bunny ears uh, because there is nothing typical about a surrogate like Amanda told me last time. And I 100% agree on that. Uh, so Amanda was just going to tell us who the the surrogate that we most commonly see, if we are going to take some kind of average example of that, uh, we're going to look through that. And then Shoshana is going to take over talking about surrogate requirements at Hatch and PFCLA, and also what kind of screening we do, uh, or Shoshana and her team does. I won't involve myself there. I have nothing to do with that. Uh, to kind of make sure we're working with the best of the best when it comes to surrogates, qualified, safe, happy, right motivation, etc. And then we're going to spend the vast majority of this time, about 20 minutes listening to Amanda and show, uh, which is the short name for Shoshana, which we use internally when we talk about their experiences of being a surrogate, not only once, twice, or three times, even four times for Shoshana. So we have a lot of great stuff here. Uh, so yeah, let's jump in and, and do that in the end. Okay, so these are uh, the people that are going to be your experts today. Um, my name is Edwin. I'm the international manager of Hatch and PFCLA. Uh, PFCLA is our in-house clinic for the ones of you that don't know that. Uh, I'm also two-time father to surrogacy in egg donation. I'm an international intended parent uh, from Europe. Uh, and then we have uh, Amanda. Go ahead, Amanda, and just brief introduction about yourself, please. Uh, I am a three-time previous surrogate, all with Hatch, all three journeys. And then I'm also uh, the director of case management. So I am over the department that is um, full of case managers that are all previous surrogates that basically take over when a, an intended parent is mapped with a surrogate. Lovely. So oh, how about you? Yeah. And then the rest of it. <laughs> Show how about you? So I'm Joshana. I'm our director of surrogate intake here at Hatch. I've been a surrogate four times also through Hatch. I've been here for over 14 years. I've kind of worked every role except for finance, um, but I currently oversee our intake department, uh, which includes our application coordinator, our intake coordinators, our intake leads, our medical records coordinators and specialists. Um, and, and our team department managers as well to thoroughly screen all of our candidates and support them through that screening process to prepare them to move on to matching and then on to Amanda's department of case management for their journeys. Yes, that's when she takes over or any of her team. Uh, my number seems a little bit bleak here, I feel like. I got to get another child. So I'm at least like a three-time <laughs> father to surrogacy. <laughs> We can make that happen. We can make that happen, Evan. I know, I know. I've, I've experienced it. We actually have a fifth time too. previous surrogate working for us. So I don't even hold the record oh. anymore. <laughs> wow, you don't. I've always been like Shoshana is the record holder. Okay, we got to remember. I, I surrender, you know, surrender. happily. <laughs> <laughs> After this long and, you know, at Hatch, you, you got to make some concessions. That's just how it works. <laughs> Wonderful. So this is who we are. So you all know uh, who you're speaking to. So let's briefly speak about Hatch and PFCLA. 
Um, mainly when we look at this journey, if we say traditionally in the United States, a lot of this has been separated for a long while. The agency has been separated from the clinic and all of these parts have been a bit more fragmented. A couple of years ago, after being partners for a very long time, Hatch, our agency, and Pacific Fertility Center, our in-house clinic, decided to merge together to create something we call the Peace of Mind program. Uh, the Peace of Mind program, very briefly, is an all-inclusive program where we cover basically, not even basically, we cover everything in this journey from beginning to the end to have intended parents get to the end result, which is a big bundle of joy, a baby, hopefully happy, not too upset and screaming, even though they do that as well, as we all know. Um, so that's the point of the program. We want to do that with one team in one place, kind of like white glove service with the fixed fee pricing where intended parents don't have to worry about all of the moving parts of surrogacy potentially egg donation and IVF. Um, and there are a lot of moving parts, which I'm sure both Sho and Amanda will attest to. Uh, so we try to make that simpler for intended parents all in one place and with the great benefit of medical oversight by our physicians. Having doctors in-house makes us able to do a lot of amazing things like pre-screen medical records with the doctor instead of with an agency staff, uterus lining checks, which we implemented 1st of May, which kind of change how we qualify surrogates. So all of that is very amazing when you have our own clinic and agency. Uh, so this is what we wanted to create with the Peace of Mind program. So we do everything non-medical on the Hatch side. We do everything medical on the IVF side. So intended parents that want to don't have to go out and find all of these different pieces. We have it all in one place. And Hatch is amazing in many ways. Uh, I mean, I was one years of age when this agency was created, so that's humbling if nothing else. Uh, 33 years of experience, 52 countries around the world. We've worked with clients from 52 countries, uh, which also impresses me as an international intended parent. Uh, we have the largest egg donor database in the US for the ones of you that are looking for egg donation. Uh, it's cost free to register, so run, run, run and do that on the website. Uh, success rate, 99.5%. Uh, we love that number, of course. And we also love to give you information on what it means. It looks at, you know, when you start a journey with Hatch, do you have a baby or not? There are nuances to this timeline, number of embryo transfers, et cetera. But this is what that number looks at. So we can discuss that more in depth in the consultation. 8,000 journeys completed and amazing surrogacy candidates. Uh, Shoshana and her team screens them thoroughly for a very long time to make sure that we accept the best possible surrogates and safest possible surrogates. And what are we at, Shoshana, 5% acceptance rates? Uh, more or less, yes. More or less, around there, yeah. So we're looking for amazing surrogate candidates, and Shoshana will speak about how we do that screening uh, to find them. All right, Amanda, can you let us know, I hate that word still, <laughs> the typical surrogate, I got to change that. Uh, <laughs> you can let us know a little bit of who is that person that our case managers you know, meet and guide with the intended parents? Yeah. So a typical surrogate is anything but typical because everyone is so different. Yes. <laughs> but we do have, you know, qualifications and um, kind of a broad spectrum. So um, the typical one would be anywhere between the 35 and 39 years old, but that does not mean that that is every surrogate. So there are surrogates that are younger than that. And there are surrogates that are older than that. Um, and, you know, at least a high school graduate in most cases, uh, we have girls that have their master's degrees, their, their doctorates and things like that too. So again, not super typical, but this is just kind of an average of what, what to expect. Um, they all have to have at least one or several children of their own. So that is a prerequisite to being a surrogate. You have to have given birth to at least one child and raising them. Um, and then they have a history of uncomplicated pregnancies and deliveries. Um, that's show will go more in depth into that. We actually do check every swinging record. So we do make sure that that is very well documented um, in a stable life setting. So we do also part of our screening is, you know, getting a good feel for these surrogates and, and making sure they're in a stable environment with support. Um, and then humanitarian women with huge hearts. So I know everybody knows that surrogates do get paid for, for this huge undertaking that they're doing, but that is, you know, the, the women we work with, that is not their number one thing that they're, or why they're doing it. They, they want to do it because they want to help people. And that's really important that Hatch works with surrogates that, you know, that is their, that's at the heart. Um, and then, you know, some of them are single. I, I think a lot of people come in, a lot of intended parents come in thinking like, this is what we want for our surrogate, but there's so many different, you know, environments and different households and how those are made up. So some of the surrogates are single and that's okay. We do make sure she 
has a support system um, built in and, you know, it could be their family, it could be their employer, it could be their neighbors, it could be lots of things. Um, and then some of them are married also, you know, and then they, they have either just the spouse or they have a really, you know, short, close knit um, support system, but, you know, they all do have support and we do make sure that they do. Yeah. And I think it's really interesting with the humanitarian motivation, like you said, Amanda, because that is a lot of questions surrounding that. And it it's not a guarantee, right, that you have a surrogate motivated by the right things. Different agencies screen that differently. Uh, but that's that's a really good point because, you know, especially international and parents, sometimes I feel like have this kind of focus on the compensation part while our surrogates are not really, that's not their main focus, which is kind of a discrepancy between what they believe they will have in terms of relationship versus what they actually have in the end. Uh, so I think that's always interesting. Uh, awesome. Thank you so much, Amanda, for walking us through that a bit. Yeah. Um, all right, Trishana. So we would love to hear about the surrogacy requirements and pre-match screening. So let's start with our in-house IVF clinic. Yeah. So uh, these are based off PFCLA's requirements. Every clinic's a little bit different. So uh, for PFCLA, surrogates, you have a body mass index cutoff uh, below 32. Ideally, we like you know, to see them somewhere between the 30 to 32 range or lower. Uh, and that's just to ensure, you know, that they're a low risk candidate for complications. Uh, age wise, they need to be below 30, 43 years of age. So some of our applicants have to be um, no older than 42 to be accepted. Um, they could still be transferring after that it takes more than one transfer, but we want to make sure that they are getting a good medical candidate for proceeding. They also have to be a minimum of 21 years of age, um, although surrogates in the 20s are much more uncommon. As Amanda said, you see many more in, in the 30s range based on just where they're at in life and their families being complete. Uh, there's a max of three C-sections. Uh, all of our candidates are getting uh, paid for by Hatch a lining check or a, a mock cycle and lining check to ensure that their lining is good. So if somebody's had three C-sections, they get a mock cycle to make sure that they're still building normal lining after having more than one C-section. Uh, they have to have a minimum of one live birth, the child that they are currently raising. It's twofold. Uh, one is that they've had a healthy delivery, so they have a good chance of having one again and a healthy pregnancy. The other is that they understand what they're giving to somebody else uh, because they're a parent themselves already. They can't have more than two miscarriages. Um, some small exceptions when there are documented embryo issues. So if they're previous surrogates and we're trying to intend to parents where embryos were not tested or there were you know, quality issues, that could be a different story. But generally speaking, no more than two, especially in their own pregnancies. Uh, they have to have a wait period after past deliveries. So if they've had a C-section birth recently, they have to wait 12 months from C-section birth to get pregnant again to give their body proper time to recover. It's six months after a vaginal birth and neither can be currently um, nursing when they get started and have, they have to have their periods kind of back to normal, body back to normal. Uh, and then the max number of pregnancies is six. So a surrogate could have had up to six deliveries before applying to be a surrogate with the surrogate being her seventh and last. Mm -hmm. um, most don't have quite as many. And once in a while, there's rare exceptions for above and beyond this when they've had um, all vaginal uncomplicated births. But generally speaking, it's pretty firm at that number. So those are the general medical requirements. Wonderful. And I like that you added that, that the, every clinic is different. So it's important if you are working with another clinic or considering another clinic to remember that this is our clinic's requirement and, you know, ask your, your clinic, if you have one already, what is their requirement? Then it could impact matching times and other things as well. So it's really important to understand every clinic's requirements. So that's a great addition uh, show. Uh, all right. Walk us through a little bit of the surrogates pre-screen. What do we do with our surrogates when they apply before they, you know, get matched? We do a whole lot. So the first thing they do is fill out a detailed application with us. It takes them about 30 minutes to an hour to complete, giving us really a great full overview of their, their health history, their pregnancy history, their social history for them and their partners. Uh, there's a review of that application. And if they qualify for an interview, then they go on to have an initial screening call. And that initial call, we go over basic qualifications, we educate them on the process, and we're feeling out that they're a good fit medically, socially, um, really all around to move on to next steps. So if they pass that initial screening call, then we send them some paperwork where we start getting what we need to gather their medical records. So we request records from every OB uh, or like a delivery provider, OB, midwife, every uh, delivery hospital, every IVF clinic that they have worked for, worked within their pregnancies, for every pregnancy. Not not all records are always available based on how much time has passed. So we get all of the available records, document anything that's not available. We also get clearance letters from their OB, um, current PAPs and uh, breast exams too. So we're making sure that they are just in optimal shape before moving on to next steps. 
Uh, while we're collecting those things, they also are going to have their social screening call. So that is a video call with their intake lead who will be with them from the time that they start that video call until they are cleared for matching as their primary contact. Intake leads are sort of the case managers of the intake and screening process. Um, and so in that call, we'll get to know them really well for the matching process, get to know their wants and needs in this, and also go over some of the tougher things. We need to make sure that they're willing to undergo things like an amnio if it's needed, um, willing to allow the parents to choose to terminate or reduce in the cases of higher level multiples or, or defects, disabilities. Um, we find out if they're willing to remain on life support, you know, if something was to happen, heaven forbid, during the pregnancy that's unforeseen to continue the pregnancy and give the baby a chance. So there are some tough things they have to kind of come over, <laughs> go over in that call, but it's a really important call. They'll have a, a video, they actually, for the medical process call, they watch a video and then they get their questions answered. So that walks them through medically what the process is for surrogacy, what to expect with medications, giving yourself shots, what type of appointments you're going to have, what kind of oversight there's going to be in the medical process. And then we have a call with their partner or support person. So for a surrogate who has a partner, it will always be the partner. But for single surrogates, we have a call with their primary support person uh, to make sure that they're on board. There's someone in their corner who knows what's happening and is going to support them through it emotionally or whatever other capacity they can offer that kind of support. We have a routine background check that's done securely through an online uh, website that's licensed to do that. It's pretty incredible, um, very secure and very private, but we get results back very quickly. And that's for the surrogate and any adults in our household. So if they live with mom and dad, if they have cousins or roommates um, or even adult children living with them, they also undergo that background check. It is uh, criminal and financial, so it's not a credit score check, but we're checking for things like bankruptcies, liens, judgments, as well as arrests and um, driving history as well. And then we do a psychological screening of our surrogates. So we refer to licensed mental health professionals who are experts in this field. They conduct a video interview with the surrogate and partner if applicable. And they also have the surrogate undergo a test called a PAI as well as some, some other assessments depending on her unique situation uh, to assess if she is a good psychological fit for surrogacy. That we're not putting her at undue risk for her mental health and well-being and that she's really prepared for this process and all that it entails. We get a detailed report back that'll go to your IVF doctor. And then they do have a mock cycle or uterine lining check. I mentioned that one earlier. So for a, they're very similar processes for a mock cycle. They take some medications similar to what they'll take in their IVF cycle, but oral, not injectable medications. Um, and then their lining is checked at a certain point in their cycle to make sure they built an adequate normal lining, no fibroid cysts or polyps that are in areas or size that are of concern um, that would impact implantation. And a lining check is the same thing, but no meds needed. That's just done at the same kind of timing in the cycle to look at how they build their lining naturally. Uh, and we're looking for lining to be uh, above an eight or above and uh, trilaminar. So to have the best chance of success, those are reviewed by Dr. Sahakian in our office to make sure that everything looks good. Um, mock cycles are done on people who have had more than two C-sections, who have had a DNC after their last pregnancy, um, who have had anything like a manual placenta removal before, things that could potentially have caused any problems with the womb, um, or who've had IUDs after their last delivery, even if they've had the IUD out for years to make sure that they still build normal lining. Everybody else can do a regular lining check and then only followed with the mock if their lining wasn't where you wanted it on its own to see if they respond to medication. The great thing about doing that, first of all, we're one of the only programs that actually does that pre-match. That's when we rolled out. We started in March with our program and now applies to all candidates as of May. And it's pretty amazing because you know that when you match with somebody, you can have a lot more confidence that when they go to their in-person medical screening, the results are going to be good. Nothing mm -hmm. is perfect. People's yeah. linings can change. People's bodies change, you know, but it gives you a, a lot more confidence in that match that medically things are going to look good when you go in for that in-person screening. Yeah. And, and that is a great addition uh, to this, this process. Sorry, go ahead. And, that's, and at the tail end of that, once the surrogate is cleared for matching, we are very big about education every step of the process. So when they're with intake, we're educating them on the process, preparing them when they're in matching, they're being prepared for their match. When they are with uh, case management, they're being prepared for their journey as it unfolds step-by-step -step support throughout the process. So what we try to do an in intake before passing them on to the next department is impart upon them all the things in their journey that they can focus on to help have a smooth journey and what they can expect to lie ahead of them. So that's our surrogate responsibility call. Um, and then they'll have their in-person medical screening after they've matched with you. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for walking us through that. And that mock cycle, that or uterus lining check, like you said, is a great, great thing to to be able to add to that kind of toolbox that you have here, because it truly is like a toolbox full of these things, which makes us, you know, find a great circuit. So, so that's amazing. Thank you so much, show. All right. Well, let's talk about you guys instead of this exciting screening stuff. So I'm sure that like myself, starting this journey there, 
I've never heard any surrogate speak about their experience, which is kind of something I feel like should be mandatory before you go into surrogacy. I'll think about that and see how I can implement that in Sweden, at least where I am. Uh, I think this would be a great thing to have done before I started. And I hope that people that are here or watch this recording afterwards or on this on YouTube uh, really get a good insight here into this. So I'm really excited to do this with you both. So I would love to start off with, you know, one of the most common questions that we get in consultations with intended parents at a certain point when they ask us, and then just wait, I just want to ask, like, why would anybody become a surrogate? You know, who are these women and, you know, why do they pursue surrogacy? If it's, you know, if it's not for monetary reasons, which we know that the ones we screen are not. So what is the kind of background? So I would love to hear for both of you why you decided to become a surrogate and what kind of led you on that path to show if you want to kick us off and then we go to hear about, about Amanda's story. Yeah, happy to. I was in junior high watching the show Friends, where Phoebe was a surrogate for her brother. She carried triplets, a lot of babies. Uh, but I thought it was just such an incredible concept that somebody could do that for somebody else. And it stuck with me. And so after I had my own first child, I was fairly young, so I had my first in my 20s. Um, it occurred to me that I met the qualifications. I'd already done a little bit of research and I felt ready to do it. Having my own came easily to me, and I had the, the realization that it's not easy for everybody. And to be able to give that back was kind of like my way of paying it back to the universe. You know, it came easily to me. It, being a mom was something I wanted to be more than anything in my entire world my whole life. Um, so to be able to give that to somebody else, it's just it's the only way I could, I think, pay, pay back the universe what it gave to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's amazing. And I love that friends part because we all, I mean, not all of us, but most of us have seen that as well. And, and then maybe consider surrogacy more at that point, but it's, it's really interesting. That was your kind of in to the whole kind of field. Uh, how about you, Amanda, TV show, newspaper, what, what happened to you? No, neither one. So I actually had a really close friend before I was a mother. Um, she was told that she would never have kids. And so I, bef again, before I was a mother, I was just like, I will have, I will have babies for you. And, um, you know, we know that's not, a, we have to have had birth, had a baby in order to be one. So I just basically, it was on my heart then. And, um, miraculously she did get pregnant. It was like, wow, Amazing. like the odds were, yeah, it was just like a miracle. So she did get pregnant at that time. I was like, well, um, I had already had several children of my own and, um, uh, my pregnancies were awesome. I was very lucky. I have very easy pregnancies and I very much enjoyed it. So I thought, well, if I'm not going to do it for her, why couldn't I do it for somebody? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, and I had some other friends that were actually, uh, they were exploring it as well. And it just kind of became one of those things. I was like, okay, how, tell me all the things about it. So, um, and we ended up doing our journeys together. So. Oh, that's nice. That's amazing. So got like a surrogate support group within that journey. That That's great. Yes. Awesome. All right. Uh, well, one part of this is, uh, you know, the, being a surrogate and being that individual, but we also know that there's obviously other people involved, right? Just like we screen the partner or other support people. So how did your kind of support people react to, to this choice? Because I think a lot of our intended parents sometimes do forget that there are other people involved from the surrogate's point of view. And um, how did, you know, they react to you saying, you know, I'm going to carry for somebody else. Uh, how about you, Amanda? So this one, my parents and my family, my, my, my husband, he was not surprised at all. I had pretty much, we had had conversations about it because it was just something I'd always thought was cool and I wanted to do. Um, and so they were just like, we're not surprised by that, Amanda. That does not surprise us at all. My husband was like, whatever, you want to do, I will support you. He's incredibly supportive. So he's like, whatever you want to do, babe, I'm here for you. Um, and he was pretty much along for the ride the entire time. Some of my family, which we do see this sometimes, some of them didn't really understand it and didn't yeah. really know what it really involves. My immediate family were like, of course you, you want to do this. Like, you know, you're amazing. This is great. And <laughs> it was just kind of goes with my personality, but some of my older family members were just like, she's going to do what? <laughs> like, what are you doing? Like, you're going to give a baby? And I was like, no, I'm not giving you a baby away. It's not going to be my baby. So, um, you know, overall, it was a really, really heartwarming response. But um, there was some education that was needed for some of them to understand what it what it entails. I can imagine. Uh, how about you, Sho? How was the family's reaction at that point? You know, you had kids, of course, and, you know, you say you had a partner, etc. Yeah. So how did they react to that? And how did you bring them on board if, if you had to? Well, at the time that I was considering doing this, I was one of the youngest surrogates to go through our program to date. And so my my extended, like my parents, um, 
thought it was incredible, but they were very much encouraging me like, well, wait till you're done having your own family. You're so young still. Um, and they, they were, they were nervous for me. So it took some education, you know, kind of getting them on board. Um, and, and I had to, it's very unusual for a surrogate to not be done with her family and pursue surrogacy. Many, most people are kind of like, they've had their kids and then they're pursuing this. I had one, I'd still hope to have more, but I was okay with the chance that if that didn't happen, it was okay. I was still would be happy that I did the surrogacy. So I was willing to take that, that small risk on. Um, so that was a little bit of a hurdle that I had to kind of personally overcome with my support system. My partner initially was very surprised and then completely on board for the four journeys that we did. Um, you know, it really was a family gift. Like your, your kids are along for the ride. Everybody's along for the ride. My kids, my oldest ones, cause I've actually had, um, I had, did one surrogacy after my first, then had my own second baby, did three more surrogacies, had my third, and I'm currently expecting my fourth due in August. Yeah. Um, yes, getting ready to retire my womb, I think probably in the near future, <laughs> but I am retired from surrogacy. I am maxed out. Um, but I've just found that for my kids growing up with this, it, it's just been incredible. Like a lesson in giving for them. And they've just, they've loved it. They get so excited for the family to be able to do this for somebody else. They are every bit as much a part of it as I am. Uh, so overall, my support system was really, really good. Uh, mm -hmm. Met it with some run-ins, you know, from the older generation having to explain it more. But even, you know, my grandmother at the time on my mom's side, I just thought it was incredible, you know, to do that for somebody else. I really found uh, almost, I'd say 99.9% .9 support. Yeah, well, and that's made, and it is incredible for sure. Um, can we just talk a little bit about how important that actual support person or family and their support is for somebody being a surrogate? Because I feel like sometimes intended parents, you know, they focus so much on the surrogate and forget that there is somebody else there and how important they are. So just from your perspective as, you know, being surrogates during these journeys, how did you kind of, how, how was that support and, and how important did you feel that it was for you to be able to carry out this, this amazing feat, uh, you know, uh, how, how did that work and how did that kind of relate to the intended parent's relationship with your partner versus with you as well, if you can chime in on that as well. Uh, Amanda, please go ahead. So um, support is so incredibly important. It's so like, and you're right. I think a lot of intended parents are like, you know, they want to know all about the surrogate, but it's like the mo in most cases and any pregnancy that anyone's ever had, it's like, even though you're physically doing it, you require support, right? Like when you have morning sickness or when you have cravings or if, you know, you have bed rest or there's complications or things, cause that happens too. Yeah. You, you have to rely on someone else to help you, whether it's your older children or your neighbor or your partner or your parent. So I, you know, I think a lot of times, you know, that, that is overlooked. And so Hatch makes sure that the surrogates do have that built in. And we also make sure that if, you know, those people aren't available, that there's more people that can support the surrogate. So for us, you know, it, for me, it was super important that everybody was on board as well. Um, and I don't think I would have ever done it without that support. So yeah. I think that was a vital part of each one of my journeys, just because, you know, you, you, even though you're physically doing, I said to yourself and my husband did feel kind of detached at certain parts because, you know, he wasn't always completely involved, but, um, I needed him to be, you know, aware of what all of that entailed for him. And then, you know, what I was undergoing as well. Yeah. And so if you kind of take the, the latter part of that question, when it comes to you know, the intended parents relationship, not only with the surrogate, which we will talk a little bit about, but also with the family. How, how was that through your journeys? Were you able to kind of involve them with, you know, not only you, but with your family and, and did that work well, or was there anything, you know? So I'm still in touch with my four families that I've delivered for, and they had direct contact with both myself and my partner at the time. And uh, it, it is really important to involve the support people because those are the people who if things come up are going to come to take care of your surrogate because you're not their boots on the ground. Often right. our parents are in other states and other countries. So if your surrogate ends up on bed rest, who's going to pick up her kids from school? Who's going to, you know, bring a hot meal if she's too nauseous to cook? You know, who's who's going to step in there? Um when the people who support her know about you know about, you know, the wonderful parent you're going to be, they're that much more motivated to step in and support her because they're also supporting you through that by take, helping to take care of your baby. So it really does take a village and involving that village is a beautiful thing. Um, you know, my, in my village, I had my, my parents, I had my partner, I had friends, I had family. And while not every of them obviously met the intended parent, my intended parents always met my partner. Um, they, when they come out to an ultrasound, they, spent time with the kids, you know, we'd got to build that connection. It also comes back to humanitarian motivation because surrogates are doing this 
to experience that connection, to see your yeah. joy. So building that connection with their family, not only does it kind of really f fulfill that for them, but it also shows them the type of parent you're going to be. When you see yeah. your intended parents and how kind they are to your own family, you you visualize what their life is going to be like with their child. And it just, it just reaffirms your decision to work with them. I think that last part is so great. And and I, I think I, I do agree with that 100%. Just having feedback from my first surrogate after the journey, like not only saying, you know, you took so great care of me and et cetera, but also like my the way you treated my family. I remember she wrote in this letter to us, thanking us or whatever, when we were leaving for Sweden. And I think that is an important part, like you said, you know, remembering that it's not only about caring about the surrogate, but like when you show your true self, you know, in, in engaging with other people, you show what kind of parents you will be. And hopefully that gives your surrogate, you know, more encouragement rather than less encouragement. But it is a beautiful thing to get to know the family. And I think any intended parent kind of thinking that they don't want a lot of communication or involvement with the family and, you know, reconsider if you can, because that is an amazing thing. You get a, you know, a, a new connections for life and you get an insight into a whole new family, which is worth so much for your own family building later. Uh, so I agree with that. So it sounds like you had a great relationship with the intended parents and with the, um, with the, with your family and with them. How about you, Amanda, when it came to communication relationship, what was that like with your intended parents during your journey? Oh. So all three of my journeys, I still, I still am in contact with all of them. Um, my first couple, we've actually gone on family vacations together with both of our families because they've grown. Um, and then my second uh, journey, they are in a pretty far away country. So it's really hard to see them, but we do communicate a lot. They send me videos and, and um, pictures of um, the baby all the time, which is not a baby anymore. And then um, my third journey, we still talk a lot. So um, the parents and I are extremely close and we have a really good relationship. They've come to visit and we um, go out to dinner and, you know, the whole family is is involved. So um, we've been very lucky. That's not always the way it turns out. It's not always that way, you know, and some people don't want that. So, um, you know, some people have different expectations and, you know, want their journey to look a little different. And that's why it's really important we match people that want the same thing. So um, I wanted a really close relationship and and I got that. So um, yeah, I still, I'm still very close to all of them. That's great. I love hearing that. And it is true, like you said, you know, matching the right intended parent with the right surrogate. That's the part of our matching department headed by Janice, also a previous surrogate. Uh, so it is really important for intended parents watching this, you know, doing an interview with you in the beginning to understand those kind of requirements or specifications, wishes, and finding the right person. That's the key to great communication. So that's what Janice and her department will, will be doing for Hatch and Tender Parents. Um, I think uh, we're going to shoot forward a little bit and talk a little bit about another question that's really, really common, especially for the more kind of maybe philosophical intended parents out there is, you know, the feeling of carrying someone else's child and somebody puts it, you know, better or worse in, you know, giving it a child away or giving a child back, which I like much more, uh, which I think show or Amanda said to me a couple of years back. And I was like, that is a great way to put it. Uh, so how did you feel uh, with that part? You know, if we focus a little bit on, you know, this is not my child, it, obviously understanding that, but how was that feeling to kind of see if we can reassure a couple of intended parents out there. They might feel that, you know, that might be hard for surrogates to to accept, but uh, please, Shoshana, chime in on that, you know, how that feeling was and knowing that that's someone else's child and how you kind of dealt with that. It's very different from carrying your own. Uh, it's exciting in new ways because there's somebody every bit as excited about that child coming into the world as you, if not, if not more so. Uh, I feel like when I carry my surrogate babies, I still absolutely love them, but I don't have a bond to them. You connect to the family. I feel connected to my intended parents, and I love that I get ongoing communication. I got to know them. I don't have relationships with the children after the birth. Going into my first journey, I really wondered how I was going to feel after the birth because I had mm -hmm. a good expectation. I really felt confident that I wasn't going to be attached to the baby. You know, you navigate the pregnancy differently. You're obviously very careful during pregnancy. But in addition to that, I'm a very connected person with all my babies. So any baby I've carried, like I've baby worn, I've nursed, I've been very like hands-on. That's my own parenting strategy. Every parent parents differently. And I certainly don't impose that on my intended parents. 
but like in pregnancy for me that translates to playing music for baby talking to baby and so in my surrogacy i had recorded books from the parents that i played for baby so they heard their parents voices i played music the parents liked so when they went home there was a song that was familiar i really felt that i was not only just carrying their child i was carrying their ability to bond with their child so i involved them a lot in the pregnancy um, so that they could build that connection so while I did do things like talking to my belly, rubbing my belly, I told them about their parents and the exciting things that were ahead of them. Um, and when I finally got to hold my surrogate babies after delivery, after the parents had the first chance to hold babies, they're adorable. Don't get me wrong. And I, I absolutely love them and want the best for them in the world, but they're not mine. I don't worry about what they're doing at night. Like my own, I worry about my own every waking minute, what they're doing. Yeah. I know somebody else is doing that. I don't have that responsibility. It was like holding a friend's baby or like a cousin, maybe like you love them. You think they're adorable, but like, there's no problem handing them back to where they belong. I never felt, um, a parental bond to them. It felt very different than my own. And I got the experience of going back and forth between surrogacy and my own and mm -hmm. be able to kind of compare, go, oh gosh, this is just so different. Mm -hmm. uh, it really is di different, I think, even than anyone can imagine until you've actually done it. Yeah. And uh, Amanda, how about you? You know, we heard a little bit about show talking about how she kind of did, did the book with the voice of the parents, et cetera, which is kind of a little bit of involving the, the intended parents, because there are a lot of intended parents that wonder, you know, I'm all the way over here and she's all the way over there. How am I even a part of this kind of nine months of pregnancy? So how did you kind of involve the intended parents? Did you have any strategies, anything that you kind of did to, to keep them involved and feeling like, you know, this is your pregnancy and, you know, don't you forget it as well? Yeah. So I would, um, I sent weekly bump pictures. So every time we'd hit a new week, I would send them a new picture of how their baby's growing and how my belly is growing. Um, I would share anything they wanted to know. So I, that was usually something I would kind of go over with my intended parents. I'm like, how much do you want to know? Cause I'm willing to share whatever you would like to be a part of, but I don't want to make you uncomfortable or, you know, so I, you know, you want to share that I'm craving this, or this makes me sick, or baby doesn't like this, or, um, there were certain things like sometimes I would, you know, have like a tablet and I'd set it on my belly and baby would kick it. So I'd share that and send them videos of baby kicking and things. So as much as I could keep them involved, I would. Um, that was like one of my goals was just to keep them, you know, like let them know all the things as if they were, you know, doing it themselves as much as I could. So, um, yeah, it was like a, it was it like show said, it's really exciting too, because you are sharing it with someone else. So, you know, when you, when you carry your own kids, it's exciting. Yeah. You're planning the nursery and doing all those things and you're, you're naming the baby, but when you're carrying it for some, someone else, they're doing all that. And so, yeah. and they're excited about the pregnancy almost more than you are in most cases. Cause you know, they've been waiting a long time for this. So it's so fun. You almost feel, I mean, you do feel pretty special, but it's just so exciting. It's like a celebrity baby because they're like so excited. So many people. And you get to, yeah. And you get to share, you know, all of that with them. So I, you know, it was, it, that was probably one of the highlights of, a, of being a surrogate was being able to share that with the intended parents and keep them involved as much as they wanted to be involved. Yeah. Which I think is an amazing thing to do. And just as an intended parent myself, you know, there is almost no too much involvement in this process like that that joy to share that with the surrogate and with the family and you know it's just an amazing thing and i think that we sometimes maybe forgetting all of our planning as intended parents you know we can i'm surely seem a little bit cold sometimes you know we look at the timelines we look at the budgets we look at all of these things and sometimes we maybe forget that you know there's nine months of amazing relationship building and an amazing experience if we want it and if we're open enough to give and as well as we get to that experience back to us so I think for intended parents out there kind of be open about you know this nine months of this big chance to get to know somebody work with them in the best possible way care about each other and I think there's a really great end result of that not only a baby but you know new connections for life um so that's great I mean this is all lovely so uh, every time something is too lovely you want to go to less lovely stuff so let let us know about a little bit of what maybe wasn't equally enjoyable in this journey because I'm sure intended parents also worry about how is she feeling what is she not liking was there anything that stood out for you for example Shoshana when you know not equally enjoyable uh, in this journey as a surrogate yeah. Uh, well, okay. Off the bat, the nausea. Uh, and some people never have a day of morning sickness. Some people never have a day of morning sickness and then get it in surrogacy. And some people opposite feel great in surrogacy. Every mm -hmm. pregnancy is different. Uh, for me, every pregnancy is the same in that regard. I'm sick with all of them. 
uh, and that's just kind of my norm still very willing to take that on for a family who can't do that for themselves and to be very humble about they would they they'd be thrilled to experience this if they could and be able to do it on their own but that part is definitely hard because you're also keeping up with taking care of your own family I'm, i was a working mom through all my surrogacies I actually wasn't going through college while doing my surrogacies too so surrogates are often very busy people with great support systems doesn't mean they can't balance it all but it does have its challenges um so that, that part was hard. And then also the, the hard things that can happen, a transfer not taking, having to start mm-hmm. over again, having, you know, a loss, those things can happen when you do everything right. You know, going into it, knowing that you're not guaranteed a healthy full-term pregnancy, even if you do all the right things, you know, once you've had that experience, it does change the next journey for you to know that that magical thinking's kind of gone, that it's just going to go perfectly because it always has. We work behind the scenes, so we kind of see everything that can happen. And that 95% does ring true. People do get to their end goal, healthy baby, but it's not always without challenges along the way. And those, those parts aren't enjoyable, but for me, they were very bonding experiences with the intended parents where when the hard stuff came up, we leaned into each other and we got through it together and we, we got to our happy ending. So it was all really worth it. Yeah. No, I think that's also important to, to kind of be transparent about that, that, you know, pregnancies, like we do everything we can, but, you know, surrogacy pregnancy is still a pregnancy. Those work great many times sometimes there are challenges and as long as the agency intended parents and surrogate can handle that together then hopefully there is a continuation to that and getting to the end result but i do like that kind of transparency because i feel like agency sometimes do like to sugarcoat that a little bit with the journey being you know unproblematic there could be bumps in the road you know we can take care of those of course but it's good to have that insight so i appreciate that show um so the last thing before we see if we have any questions and we wrap this up a little bit um the right agency for you as, as, you know, previous surrogates, so, you know, I know you worked with Hatch, et cetera. I'm sure you looked into other options as well, but how important is the right agency for someone who wants to become a surrogate and what makes a surrogate decide for, you know, one agency over the other? Um, can you chime in on that a little bit, Amanda? Oh my goodness. The right agency is so important and there are so many out there. And so, you know, sometimes You'll, I mean, you know, you know, the minute I remember the first time I did a journey and I was not working for Hatch. So I was not an employee, but I, I did interview some and, um, I knew the minute, like the minute I spoke to them and how they handled everything. I knew I was like, this is it. I, I didn't you know, like, it was easy for me and it's not easy. And like, that was a while ago. And now there's so many more and it makes the decision so much harder but I think, you know, knowing what a company stands for, um, knowing that you fit the requirements and just getting like, we all have guts, right? We all know and can listen to our guts and you you know when there's a good fit for something, but it's like so important. I think there's so many people that don't understand how much support an agency brings to a journey. And it's like, it it's incredible. I know there's a lot of women out there that do independent journeys and, and that might be great for them, but it is like there is so much that an agency does and brings to your journey. And it just takes off that, the, a lot of stress. I mean, not that journeys aren't stressful in and of themselves, pregnancies, babies, parenthood, it's all a little stressful, right? I think we all know that. And then people that are going through it will know, but um, yeah, having somebody just like another layer of support through the entire journey for both parties, for the intended parents and for the surrogates, like you cannot like there's no limit to that. Like it's so important and, you know, do your research and really, you know, we, we encourage people to do that. It's like, yeah, we work for Hatch and Hatch is amazing, but it might not be the right fit for you. And that's okay too, but you need to find the right one for you and they are out there. So it's very important. Yeah. And the research is important. And we say that to intended parents as well, not only surrogates, I'm sure, research should i speak to more agencies absolutely because you know it might be hatch it might not be hatch and you know it's important to know the options um shoshana do you mind writing this up a little bit for us uh, any last advice for intended parents looking to undertake surrogacy uh, from you know a surrogate's perspective anything you want to throw in there before we see if we have any questions absolutely so i say this to every surrogate that we screen um that essentially the intended parents uh, they're trusting you with the most critical nine months of their child's life. That is a big thing you were trusting this person with that you were just meeting. They are also trusting you with that child for a lifetime. So the only way to go into this process is with mutual respect and trust that you are on the same team, that you were in it for the same reasons, to have a great outcome. And for everybody, 
to always be empathetic to one another, to be sensitive in their communication and to do their best, to put their best foot forward in every step along the way um, to get through it as a team. And if you take that perspective, you are setting yourself up for success, no matter what hurdles you hit along the way. So that that's what I'd leave you with. Yeah, I love that. It's all about collaboration for sure. Uh, I agree. Uh, wonderful. So so uh, anybody watching this that might want to speak to us uh, about, you know, surrogacy, explanation, IVF parts, uh, you can schedule a call by emailing me. You can also go to Hatch and fill out a form. So you'll be sent the right way, depending if you're domestic or international. Uh, you can also scan these uh, QR codes. I never managed, but I know they work because I managed once when I did this. So they, they do work. I'm just not really good at that. So you can check out our Hatch, Hatch event page. We go around the world actually having events. I was in London last weekend or two weekends ago. And Shoshana was calling in there in 5 a.m. in the morning. I still haven't sent you my thank you email for that. Uh, it's coming. Uh, so we go around the world. We have in-person events. We have a lot of these webinars as well on a lot of topics. Uh, so check it out there as well. Uh, so let's see if we no questions so far, but let's see if somebody wants to chime in uh, here uh, with any questions uh, while we have the chance. I'm clicking away here uh, to see if somebody has a question. Um, so far, no questions. It's been kind of informative and the show and Amanda, thank you so much for all of this insight into this journey. I actually learned a lot of new stuff for mock cycle. For example, I was a little bit unsure when you would actually do that. So I love this field of work. You always learn something new, even after three years in, in at Hatch and PFCLA. Um, all right. Well, we don't have any questions, so I'm going to thank everybody for coming in Amanda and show for taking the time. And yeah, keep in touch with us and best of luck on your research out there. I hope you all get to that amazing end result that you're uh, pursuing, which is a happy family. Uh, thank you and be safe out there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Oh, let's see if we have a question, if we can hang on. Yes, let's do that. One question here. Do you have a percentage of surrogates declining a process? Hmm, declining a process. So what you mean they're that... passing a screening step or declining to let the parents do something in the process, maybe? What are the po topics they refuse? So in what way oh, do you okay. mean topic? Do you do you understand? Uh, you mean that? like surrogates, whether they're willing to like vaccinate, terminate, that sort of thing? Is that what we're make sure I understood the question? Yeah. See if we can get a little bit of clarification on, on the question, just kind of what you're thinking of when you say topics they refuse. I mean, they oh. attend the parent. Okay, got it. So a little bit of, uh, at the match when somebody uh, refuses an intended parent. Well, I guess- the oh, surrogate it, to turn down the intended parents. Fairly yeah. uncommon. So uh, what happens in the matching process is our match coordinators speak with both surrogates and intended parents to go over what they're both looking for to make compatible matches off a number of criteria. So generally speaking, people do go with the first match and feel pretty good about it. Once in a while, it's not the right fit after that match meeting and they decide one party or both decide, you know, it's not the right fit and they will try again with another match. But surrogates are much more um, flexible, I think, than intended parents. And it's it actually encouraged intended parents to keep a really open mind in the matching process, too, because it's so easy to get hung up on like a list of criteria. But if you meet someone when you know, you know, like it, this is a human process. So, yes, you could focus on height, weight, location, all of those things. But it's best to leave the medical decisions to your doctor to review and medically approve a candidate. Uh, and the social recommendations to your your match coordinator of who's going to be a good fit and make this a great journey with you guys together. Yeah, absolutely. And just like you said, show nine out of ten of our intended parents do match with the first surrogate. We suggest them. Uh, I can't speak today. Suggest <laughs> them, and it goes both ways, right? Surrogate makes a decision, and intended parents do as well. Uh, so, but it's a great, great question. Uh, you're very welcome. Sorry that I we would actually add to that really quickly. You can yeah. really help your chances of. Um, having a great match with a surrogate by you'll you'll write a dear surrogate letter in your match process sharing about who you are why you're doing this including pictures those really help in matching and also yeah. being just um being yourself being kind you know being open on that match meeting letting yourself be vulnerable sharing about who you are and why you're doing this it's very much about a human connection surrogates want to see who you are and what the life is going to be like for that child so it can be nerve wracking. People can be very guarded, but I really encourage people to be really open in those interviews and sharing who they are and what they want out of this process. Yeah, absolutely. And requirements overall on location of surrogates, et cetera, also does help. The larger the pool, the, you know, the hopefully quicker the match, even though we look at a lot of different specifications for a suitable match. Uh, but I agree with that as well. So that's a great question and a great answer. 
Uh, so now I'm going to let everybody go. We ran over time. So I'm just let everybody go back to whatever they're doing. I know some are in the U.S. having lunch breaks. Uh, others are in, in Europe or elsewhere in the middle of the evening. So thanks once again. And yeah, stay safe and we'll speak soon, all of you, hopefully. Bye-bye.